we're coming to the end here and we're, we're getting ready when you guys need to start working on your plan of action. Uh, so I, I, I know this is not a workshop based solely on pedagogy, but hopefully you've seen uh, some of our approach to teaching has come through just in, in how we've been presenting things. And, and I did want to be very deliberate about um, one of the activities we did yesterday, just so that you can think about this as teachers going back, planning curriculum and planning on how you're going to work with kids. Um, like I said, my, my background is, is high school and a lot of the professional development I've done is with elementary teachers. And for about the last 10 years, we've been working on this initiative for this next generation science standards. And hopefully you'll start to see the benefits of that at the college level. But one of the things that we're supposed to do is engage kids in engineering design projects like you guys did with the drill rig. And we're also supposed to engage them in authentic investigations. You've, you've heard some unbelievable investigations from our scientists, real science that they're doing. But, but yesterday, I was pretty deliberate at asking the question about the goo in a certain way. Louise brought out that goo, we made this fantastic goo, and then, you know, we kind of challenged Bob with his, you know, uh, explanation, and, and, I, and I asked you, basically, how fast does the ice flow at all those different locations along the front? I did that with the intent of getting you to move up a little bit on this inquiry scale. So when I'm designing curriculum for my own classroom, this is not, again, not my resource, but this is, um, I picked this resource up from somebody else who picked it up from the Schwab and Heron, but they actually, when they talk about curriculum design, they frame it in terms of what level of inquiry you're actually at. So what I'd like you to do, there's a whole article and we can post the link to the whole article if you'd like to read this, because this article really did change my teaching. Um, but when I ask a question like that question above, and then you guys went and did that glacier goo experiment last night, could you look at that table and just hold some fingers up, one, two, three, or zero? What level of inquiry were we engaged in last night with the goo ball? I'm seeing a couple of signals from people and I see Carol's got a fly in her room. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Bill, I missed the beginning. I'm sorry. Oh, that, I was trying okay. to that's... take care of the doggies. Oh, that, I saw your dog doing experiments with you, so that's fine. Yeah, so, so last night, I think we were deliberately in a level two exercise. Um, I did give you the problem, but I didn't at all tell you how to solve the problem. You guys came up with your own procedure and then you guys came up with your own conclusion. Now contrast that, uh, we could have presented the exact same thing as a level zero activity. We could have said, you know, glaciers move fastest in the middle and they move slowest on the outside. Right. If, if you take this goo ball and set up a ramp at 15 degrees and put 100 milliliters of goo on the end and draw a line that's three centimeters across, and wait for five minutes, you will see that the middle moves faster. Then we could have said, go and do it. And you could have done the experiment and found out exactly what we told you at the beginning. Right. <laughs> now, I, research shows that performance wise, there's really no difference in achievement level from kids who are taught in a very direct way and kids who are taught at a level two or a level three where there's a lot more control given. But what I've never seen research quantify is what you guys are really after. But your goal, your mission, as you move forward to make this plan of action, is to work at these minority serving institutions and inspire a whole next generation of scientists. So what the research doesn't cover is, hey, how motivated, how engaged, how much in love with science do kids become when instead of telling them the answer, telling them how to do it and telling them, go do it now, if instead you just phrase a problem to them and let them figure out how to do it and let them engage, get engaged in that actual process of science. And, and that's what we firmly believe in this workshop, that the inspire kids with a love of science are gonna go on and do great things. Yeah, so, Bill, 
I'm sorry, I was just going to no, jump go in. Ahead, I was uh, attending a workshop the other day and they brought up a paper and I'll have to go look it up, but they were saying that it's, even at the college level, when you directly give them all this information versus kind of open end it, um, when you test students on it, even though the group that was given all the information might feel or assume that they know more information, but yet they test lower than the ones who had open-ended information who may not have felt, well, you didn't teach me much because I was just asking all the questions, but yet their assessment levels go very much higher. So I'm a firm believer in shifting it uh, all to, to open uh, in mm -hmm. that sense. And if you could post that resource, that would be great to see the actual um, numbers on that too. But this table has changed my life. Now, I'm not saying that there's never a time for a level zero activity. If you're going to teach a kid how to use a microscope, it's like, hey, here's what should happen. Here's how you do it. Let's practice that technique. But there's also times when you, when you even could have the kids watch something in class and you could get them to generate their own problem. You know what I mean? I, if you're creative enough as a teacher. And I think you can also take baby steps. If you're aware of this in your head and you have this framework in your head, I think it allows you then to start pulling back. And Benjamin Franklin said something he wrote, um, and I think about it all the time. He wrote, if I had more time, I would write less. And every time that I pull up a keynote, every time I pull up a lab, I say, hey, how many, how many instructions can I pull out? How many words can I pull out? And I think you've heard that pushback during this workshop. You've heard a lot of questions like, well, how many milliliters do I have to add? It's like, hey, I, I don't care. Dump whatever you want in there. So that's just little pulling back so that those kids can start to make some of those decisions on their own. If it's not important that they use 100 milliliters, just tell the kids, hey, use some water. Let them make the decisions. And little by hey, little, you can gonna... start. Go ahead, Leanne. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, amplify the, the pushback. And especially if you have students that are coming in so that earth science class or largely freshmen coming straight out of high school in the fall or they just hate to have to make any decisions on their own so it makes it you know that's the i think that's the toughest thing about you know switching how you approach things is getting the getting the students not to mutiny you know and there is some frustration and sometimes it's a matter of they have to realize that you're not going to change and then sometimes also as a teacher, you have to be patient and say, if they all screwed up the first time, I have to be willing to come back and spend some more time on this until they can figure it out and have some success. Because it is a fine line as a teacher. You don't want to have them too frustrated because you can go over the line too and just make them frustrated where they don't like it. And again, that, that, that's, your, that's your gift as a teacher to be able to create those environments where we go step by step by step and start taking them to a different place than they came into your room with at the beginning. So one of the thing, Bill, uh, I am, you know, teaching in Delaware State University 18 years. I am teaching environmental science, climate science courses to minority students in and out every year. One of the thing that never change, they do, they want to play with things. They want to do things. This is the, this has been the only way for me to get their motivation. Somehow, even reading with you together in the class, like we, I have to make the reading fun and like debates, like discussions, because they don't want to read themselves and come to the class prepare. Like we are basically teaching how to read things. We are teaching how to write the reports. We are also teaching how to start the experiment, like do something. Mm -hmm. Why then? We got students motivated enough towards the end of the semester that they're like, oh my God, we learned a lot. Because I know from my experience this semester, we switched the whole class online. Number one complaint I had, we were supposed to go to the field trip. How about Baltimore Aquarium? We were supposed to see the ocean creatures. And then the, all these things, because they really make their mind. We were supposed to have the ice lab. Like, we can't do this. Like they think they are not going to understand it. Like in their mind, they have to touch, do things with us. Yeah, they, they, they kids love those experiences. And I think when you say that, hey, these kids love to play with things, that's human nature. And I think a lot of times school is really good at stamping that human nature out. But you as teachers, yeah, your job is to activate that, that inquisitive nature in them and then pursue it in, in, a, very, in a very engaging way. So 
Um, I, I bring this table up also because um, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Layla, who's been behind the scenes recording things and uh, switching things over. But uh, Layla was actually a student in my classroom when she was a sophomore in high school. And um, I, I think if you asked her about her experience in my classroom, she'd say, yeah, we did a lot of level um, two type of experiments where I gave them the problem and, and some level one where I would give them the problem and tell them how to do it, but they always had to figure out what it meant. And then some level two where they were able to actually figure out how to do the experiment themselves. But when they were done with my class, they had an opportunity at our school to take a class called independent research. And the independent research class was actually entirely built on this level three inquiry where students develop their own problem, figure out how to solve that problem, and then figure out what the answer is. So Layla actually engaged in that whole process, had a lot of success with that process, and I just wanted her to um, share her story, not only of the inquiry and the science that she did, um, but also some of her experiences after she started to present that research at some science symposium in the springtime. So I'm gonna unshare my computer and uh, turn it over to Layla here. Thank you. Um, I'll just put my screen up real quick and then we can go ahead. Sorry. All right. Um, so I'm Layla. Nice to like see you guys and you guys can see my face finally. Um, I'm currently a rising sophomore at NYU and I'm going to present some research I did um, during high school for two years, my junior and senior year. So my experiment was the effects of nitrogen starvation of the lipid productivity of cholera laminatissima, which is a mouthful, but it is a fun experiment. So just some background on me. Um, my dad is a lung cancer researcher and he used to bring home dry ice sometimes. And I just thought science has to be magic and I wanted to be there. I also grew up in Denver, Colorado and experienced a lot of the effects of climate change early on. I remember one time at a park near my house, there were field fire because of the dryness and the amount of heat that we had that summer. So I decided much later on that I needed to do something about the climate crisis. Um, the thing that I decided to focus on was energy use. Um, here's a little graph from 2010, which has US energy consumption by energy source. Renewable energy makes up 8% of the total graph and of that 8%, 20% are biofuels. So just a little background on biofuels. There are several different generations of biofuels. First generation biofuels are things such as sugar cane, which are feedstocks and things that humans usually can ingest. Second generation biofuels are also considered feedstocks, but there are things that we typically don't ingest. I decided to go with the third and most advanced form of biofuel, which is algae biofuel. I decided to do this for several reasons and because it's an emerging field that has been studied by companies such as ExxonMobil. The whole purpose of using a biofuel is to extract the lipids from the cellulose, which as we all know is the fats. The reason why we do this is to extract, um, because lipids have hydrocarbon structures. Here you can see a little chart which has ethane and propane, which when broken and combusted create energy. Um, the reason why algae biofuel is so beneficial is because of net carbon creation. When algae biofuel is burned, carbon dioxide is released, which then is absorbed by the algae again, and again created into more algae biofuel, which helps to create a net carbon creation of zero hypothetically. However, there are several challenges which limit the implementation of algae biofuel. Firstly, there's a lack of diversity within the crop, which leads to a phenomenon known as monoculture. Say if one strain of algae gets sick and that's your whole crop, you're basically out of luck for the rest of the year and your entire product is gone. Secondly, the relative lack of efficiency of algae in comparison to traditional fossil fuels is cause for concern and also it makes it more cost prohibitive. And thirdly, the use of inorganic compounds can create possible contaminations and runoffs into drinking water and natural springs. So to remedy this first problem, I decided to use a relatively understudied um, marine algae known as C. minatissima. I decided to use it because one, it's a marine algae, and secondly, it has a relatively high lipid productivity um, in comparison to other cholerella um, species. 
I then decided to implement a technique known as nitrogen starvation um, to improve the efficiency of the actual algae itself. I decided to use two different types of um, nitrogen, organic and inorganic. It has been shown throughout several studies that regardless of the type, when nitrogen is decreased, lipids within the cell actually increase. Here's another schematic which kind of shows this. These yellow dots right here represent lipids, and here is a nitrogen sufficient group and a nitrogen deficient group. You can see that there's a lot more lipids in the starved group. I then decided to use urea and sodium nitrate for my two different nitrogen sources. I decided to use urea because it's found in human waste and therefore could be found in waste water. I decided to use sodium nitrate because if you're making an artificial um, marine environment, it could be possibly, it could possibly supplement the amount of sodium within that stock. Um, so here's my procedure overview. First, I chose the media, whether it be urea or sodium nitrate. Then I chose whether or not what um, it would be nitrogen starved. Sufficient was 8.8 .8 millimolar, and I found this from a stock solution provided by the University of Texas. I then decreased this by half to create my deeply group. Um, and here's some experimental design. I used the same amount of CO2 per day. It was two minutes a day. I used the same light for all samples and the same amount of time of light, which was 12 hours light, 12 hours dark. And here's a little photo of me by my setup, feeling very sciencey and very cool. Um, so the first step of my procedure was to create the media. I would place two different amounts of um, nitrogen and two different types of nitrogen, which would then be in the stock and hopefully would show different amounts of lipids. I then inoculated the algae, which is just a fancy way of saying I put the algae in what I wanted it to grow in, and then I allowed it to grow for eight months. Throughout this process, I ran into my first problem, however. As you can see in this picture to the right, the algae began to turn this grayish color and die and almost dissolve. Um, so I had to think of why this was occurring while continuing to bolster up my harvest. Then I dried my algae. So I placed it on a tray to increase surface area, placed it in an incubator at a temperature that I know would kill it instantly so it didn't continue to grow. And then I allowed it to dry completely overnight. Then I got to use a super cool machine known as a bomb calorimeter to actually extract the lipids from the cellulose. So as you can see here, uh, the way this works is I put hexane, which is superpolar, in the bomb actual part and then it would evaporate, go into the thimble, drip down, back down, and then this little spigot that you can see in this video would fill up and drop back down into the container that had the hexane within it. Um, then after that process was done and I allowed it to run for several cycles, I uh, poured the hexane lipid solution out and allowed all of the hexane to evaporate. I then got the two masses of both the deplete and sufficient groups and measured the different weights between them. Um, so unfortunately, I lost the original PowerPoint, which had all of my pretty graphs and all my pretty data. So I'll just show you a hopefully pretty notebook that had a lot of my data in it. I measured the weights and then did the average of all of the groups. Um, I then ran several statistical analyses such as a t-test, an f-test, and an ANOVA test to see whether or not my groups had statistical significance. The statistical significance was sufficient between the sufficient and deplete groups because it had an alpha value of over 0.05. However, there was no statistical differences between the inorganic and organic groups. And as a scientist, I thought this was a bad thing because I was like so driven to get statistical significance. But then I realized that this was actually a positive because it showed that the organic sources of nitrogen can be a replacement for the inorganic sources. So that is positive for the environment. <laughs> um, so some further applications of this research is um, the development of wastewater algae growth tanks and using wastewater in more farming and more alternative fuel sources.
Another uh, application could be the bolstering of marine algae plants and the diversification of the types of algae used. Um, so this was the end of the presentation, and I've given this presentation and practiced this presentation probably a thousand times, but all of this did not occur in a vacuum. During this time that I was actually doing the research, my school was in a lot of upheaval. A documentary, my high school was the subject of a documentary which discussed the recreation of segregation through the trafficking system. I knew this to be true from my own experience because I was typically the only person in my STEM classes. But it was easy to ignore with the stress and distractions of having to run a bomb calorimeter and having to do so many statistical tests. However, after the research was done and the papers were written, it came time to present and the problem became too large to ignore. For every competition I went to, I can count on one hand all the people that looked like me. Here in this photo where I'm holding my presidential um, acknowledgement award out of 273 competitors from all across the world, there were only three of us, including me. At another international competition, which you can see to the right, I was informed that I was the first black person in five years to make it to this level. At the same competition, a sponsor referred to Africa as a country three times, a fellow competitor used the N-word, and yet they made sure that I was featured in all of the videos. They used my images at, without giving me the actual support I needed. I needed someone to support the person who did the science and not the idea of me as a scientist. As a person in a situation where I had felt more alienated than I had ever before, I needed someone to make me feel included as a person and validate my ideas. I felt actually felt so disillusioned after this event that I decided not to pursue a STEM career, um, but the scientist's need for data really bugged me because I can never get away from science, I love it too much. Um, and I found out that black people only make, who make up 11% of the total workforce only make up 8% of computer and math workers. And the gap was even larger for Latinx people who make up 16% of the workforce, but only 7% of computer and math workers. And the same was true for education. 30% of Latinx uh, students and 40% of Black STEM majors switch majors as undergrads compared to the 29% of white STEM majors. The data fit my lived experience, but my experience shouldn't be the, a common experience. It should be the outlier. Throughout my experience with STEM though, one experience really stuck out to me. I worked for the Student Conservation Association for the summer doing great conservation, conservation work in my local forest preserve. They took us on a field trip every Friday and this particular trip, we went to the field museum to learn about jobs in the environmental field. I heard a life-changing discussion of climate justice and class and race environmental discrimination about field work and about black female scientists and a black female scientist who discuss being a person of color in the field. I came up to her after her talk and asked her how she could do, keep doing science with all the pain and hardships and rejections. And she told me that she loves science and that's why she kept going. It helped me to realize that behind all the pomp and coolness of the myth of science, there are simply people who love science. And we as a community have to make a space of inclusivity and understanding to allow this passion and this love to flourish. Because when we allow people to explore their passions uninhibited, the results are unimaginable. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank you, Layla. Incredible. That was amazing, Layla. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, I, we can open it up for questions. The last high school I worked at, like Layla said, was in a lot of, uh, kind of a lot of uh, racial unrest, if that would be a accurate way to put it. Um, where our, our school, I do give them credit. We were actively looking at ways to close the achievement gap 
However, they've been looking at that for the last 20 or 30 years without making much progress. So, um, and, they, and it was a um, documentary was being filmed at the school and teachers went through 11 years of race training and things like that. What, what I learned from that 11 years of race training was that um, I have no business doing any race training myself. Uh, so that was rule number one that I learned after 11 years of doing this. So, um, but I did talk with Layla yesterday and, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit over time just about race and some different things. I just said, Layla, here are my observations. Are these valid? And do you think these would be worthwhile sharing? And she said, yeah, that would be worthwhile sharing. So what, what I'll share with you is I went from a school for 20 years. I taught at, at schools that were about 98% white kids to um, my last 11 years where it was on the, the you know, near west side or far west side of Chicago there. And it was, it was and, and these are my observations as a teacher that might be in your left-hand column for teacher ideas as you go to implement your uh, plan of action here with climate. So the, the first thing I noticed was I needed to listen a lot more. Um, when we started this workshop, we started with notebooks here and we started with quotes, and we started with pictures of what's most important to you on the cover of your notebooks. And that, that was specifically to model with you how important we thought it was to connect with you as people and to listen to who you were. Um, and and my, I implemented that strategy with my kids only my last year of teaching. Layla actually said, we didn't get to do that. I would have loved to have decorated my notebook. Well, that, that last year when I, you know, you're, you're kind of free when you're in your last year of doing something. And I started to try all these new things and it was the most successful thing I did because it allowed me to listen to the students a lot more and start conversations so I could do that. Um, I, I realized I had blind spots. And when you start listening more, you start to see your own blind spots, but you can't do that if you're not listening. I, when I started to listen more, I realized there was big cultural differences that I wasn't aware of. And um, I also, as Layla said, when she really had a teacher just take time to say, hey, how are you doing outside? Um, I know, at, especially at the college level, the, the, the challenges that your students have to have outside the classroom are unbelievable. And, um, you know, measuring density correctly to three significant figures might not be their top priority that day. So, um, but those notebooks, allowed me to start to establish relationships where I could listen and start to see all those things instead of hearing that the challenges that were outside the classroom that um, I often found were significant and before that I hadn't seen. Uh, the, the second thing that I observed is this idea of respect and I think you're seeing that with a lot of the um, demonstrations around the country right now. It's kind of at, a, at, at the foundation. Um, and what I learned is that some cultures, your actions lead to respect, and in other cultures, respect leads to actions. And that was kind of a, um, a flip for me that I had never considered, but after watching and, and observing my own classroom, I, I realized that that was important. Uh, I think Paramita the other day demonstrated this, trust. Um, she posted pictures of her kids running around with backpacks with six, seven, eight hundred dollars of instrumentation in them. And I think that's really important is you put the equipment out there with your kids and you trust them, even if they haven't come from a science background. This stuff gets broken. That's why you have a budget. That's why you go to people like Louise and say, hey, buy me more stuff. Or, um, it, but put the stuff in the kid's hand and trust them to do the right thing with it. Um, you know, I've lost some equipment. I lost a Geiger counter once because some kid wanted to measure and see if they had radon in their basement. Well, how great is that? You know, and it got broken, but we bought another one. So, but trust them to take the equipment and do things. And um, last but not least, the last two kind of go together, patienting and scaffolding. Uh, I always taught the lowest level chemistry class and I taught the highest level chemistry class. And I always made sure that the experiences, the lab experiences in both groups were the same, including field trips. So the, lower, the lowest level chemistry class did the same field trip as the highest level chemistry class. It just took us a little bit more time to get ready for it and a little bit more scaffolding to get those students ready to go out in the field so that they could do some great science themselves. So maybe some of those will fit on the left-hand side of your page and be some ideas as Lauren comes on and starts talking about crafting your own plan of action. But um, that has been my experience. 
And um, last but not least, we started this whole workshop with tree cookies. Oh yeah, question, Karen, go ahead. Bill, I'm sorry, I, my screen shows the chat box. So was number four experience or patience? Oh, I, I thought that was just mine. Let me get rid of it. There you go. Thank you. That's good. It is patience. Okay. Uh, you never know exactly how much is being shared here of my digital environment. You know? No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The patience and scaffolding, I, I found those two kind of go together. Um, so I, if it's okay, I'd like to bring it back to the, um, to, to the tree cookies that we started with. Um, <coughs> everybody has mentors in their life. And uh, this is one of my mentors. His name is Jim Effinger. He's probably the best inquiry teacher I know. He's not involved in this workshop because he's a little bit technology challenged. He's the old school there. There's this new headset he got for his iPhone. But um, he did share this with me. Uh, and, and it's actually out of some research out of Purdue, but they're called the eternal verities. These are things that have always been true about teaching. And, and a lot of you I've heard as you're getting ready to teach new classes, Dom is starting to get ready for a climate justice class or something like that, I thought. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been working with Louise for the last six or eight months to get ready for this workshop. And, and that eternal verity is incredibly true, I think. Um, so give yourself a break and, and recognize you're drinking fast. When we listen to all these scientists, uh, Zoe and everybody, it's, it's amazing. So. Uh, as you do your plan of action, you're going to learn a lot and your kids are going to learn some of that. But when we got ready for this, uh, when we were getting ready for the um, tree ring exercise, making direct measurements, I, I go do a lot of running in my neighborhood here and, and I do a lot of thinking. And what I learned was, um, I learned five different lessons from looking at those little tree rings. So, here are the lessons that I learned from looking at the tree rings. Um, lesson number one, oftentimes when you look at the tree ring, the inner growth rings are much bigger than the outer growth rings. And now we know that that means how fast the tree is growing. Um, so when you're a new teacher just starting out, uh, you grow really, really, really fast. Uh, and when you get older, sometimes you don't grow as fast as a teacher. But I think that's all normal, as long as you count, challenge yourself to grow a little bit each year. And when you look around on the screen, it's amazing to me, the combination of teachers that we have in this workshop, from some who are younger and some who are more experienced, we'll say, and everybody's still working on growing. So I give you guys all um, huge kudos for taking a week out of your life to spend hours and hours every day on Zoom when you've just come off a semester of Zooming to continue that growth. So we really want to thank you for that. And I learned that from the tree also. Um, I live in California now where there's these giant redwoods, but I came from the Midwest where there are these giant oak trees. And, and now that I know a little bit more to look at the slices, I, I look at the slices of these, and this is actually what the tree rings look like. I never knew it, but redwoods are one of the fastest growing trees in the world. Oak trees, slow growing tree. And um, I, I took from that, it doesn't matter if you grow fast, if you grow slow, you can be one of these giants and you can have a giant impact on your kids that are coming to see you next fall. If you just continue to grow, add more knowledge, get better as a teacher, better as a teacher, engage more kids. So that was my second lesson. My third lesson is um, pretty relevant with what's going on today. Uh, this middle dark part of a log, when you look at it, actually has another name. Uh, that's called the heartwood. It's not growing anymore, but it's really super strong. And that's what gives the tree strength. Um, and this has been a crazy year from virtual classrooms to handing out food at high schools and stuff like that because our kids don't have food anymore. Uh, all that though develops the heartwood that makes you stronger as a teacher. So I know that this spring, I mean, just getting ready for this one week has been an incredible amount of work and I can't imagine you guys getting ready to teach a whole semester. <laughs> you know, teaching is I think one of the hardest professions in the world right now, but have faith. All those, that heartwood eventually when it's there and developed will make you stronger down the road. 
And last but not least, almost last but not least, uh, when we look at those tree rings, uh, Eric talked about how the wet years are really good growth years and you have these really wide rings. Well, the drought years, those hard years are really narrow in a tree. But the cool thing, if you start to tie things together, those drought years, when the rings are really, really close, those hard years are what makes the tree really, really strong. So I think that's, I think as long as you survive, which we're still all here, <laughs> uh, we, we can get stronger. And last but not least, um, you can take your mics off for this because I would like to um, hear your guesses. Does anybody know um, what kind of a tree that is there? Is that elm? Good, good joy, good, good guess. Any other guesses? Maple. Maple tree. I was thinking maple tree. See, sometimes when, when it's really, really young, you have to wait a few years, and as it develops, you can tell more what it's going to turn into. Uh, there is another picture of the tree. Any other guesses out there? Bike. Yes. Big tree. You see, even as it's growing, it's, it's still hard to tell where it's going to end up. How about if I uh, put that on? Oh, yeah. Is it apple? Yes, it is an apple tree. Oh. <laughs> only the fruit trees I can identify. I am so bad with the other trees. So I, I guess that's the last lesson I'd like you to take. And, and you guys are in the perfect position to, to have an impact here. When we see these kids when they're young in our classrooms, and when we see them when they're like Layla when she was in my high school classroom, and you see them now in your college classroom, um, it takes years and years before we know what they're gonna become. And uh, these kids that start out with you can go on to be the science giants, and that is what this workshop is all about, is having you guys inspire the next generation of, uh, of great scientists and making sure that they look more like our general population. So, um, Thank you for being here this week, and thank you for doing the work that's incredibly important, uh, and thank you for trying to make a difference in uh, equity in the field of science.